So the outline of the talk is I'm going to tell you about our first about our regional approaches to climate change project and how that came to be and what it looks like and where we are in that effort. And then especially since I know that there's the interest in how do you facilitate integration here at the SUSINC, um, some of the challenges and approaches we're taking in that project to achieve integration. And then focus on uh, the toolbox workshop, which is something that I know that John is interested in and some others here at SUSINC that I had something to do with the genesis of that project and uh, how we're how we have been uh, developing the toolbox since the 2007 article that provided the concept for it and then how we've been using it inside the REACH project so connecting the two. So uh, I'm an entomologist so I have to show some insect pictures and I'm insect ecologist and I study vectoring of uh, pa uh, plant pathogens by aphids uh, that turns into uh, almost always having to think more uh, about the system so I see I see the systems each one of the insects I showed there is a representative of the one of the components in the complex systems and I can keep on zooming out but at least we have some farmers in there to indicate that what we're really thinking about is the interacting human and natural system that is an agricult agricultural system. And I'm all just get to think about that and have to. So <clears throat> the uh, regional approaches to climate change in Pacific Northwest agriculture is the first thing I'll talk about that is uh, integrated in that way. And it is a $20 million project funded by the National Institute for Food and Agriculture, which is a, a new grant relatively new within the last few years name for the the uh, competitive funding arm of the USDA and this is a project that's collaborative between the University of Idaho um, Washington State University Oregon State University the Agricultural Research Service in our region and there those four institutions academic units 12 academic units more than 30 scientists uh, about 30 postdocs and graduate students that's the size of the operation and uh, it's hosted at the University of Idaho so we're out there uh, you can see the agricultural landscape right behind the University we're nestled out there very nicely and it's uh, the land-grant institution for Idaho and it's one of those uh, or maybe the only one that was founded before its state became a state uh, Idaho wasn't a state when the land grant was established there. So this is the USDA National Ag Statistics Cropland Data Layer image for wheat. And uh, it's grown everywhere in the US, but that's our laboratory for the REACH project. You can see it's quite well delineated, visible from space. Uh, it's about 17% of US wheat production, some of the most productive wheat land in the world. And it looks like that. Uh, a lot of it does. It's a local dune-like landscape that's covered with agriculture and uh, a few remnants of native habitat, which is another project I won't be talking about today. And uh, lots of challenges to production there. Uh, some of the region is too dry for rain-fed agriculture and we have to irrigate. Other places uh, we have huge er uh, land erosion, soil erosion problems, some of the biggest rates in the, in the U.S. And also the, just the challenges of doing, uh, running the equipment on the, those terrains. Uh, <coughs> this is our project region, and uh, the brown in there is wheat. And it's spring wheat, winter wheat, and wheat fallow systems are predominant and it can be divided into a number of uh, production zones it depends on degree day accumulations and uh, annual precipitation so this is going too fast so this is a uh, an agricultural ecological zonation in the numbers that has been established for about uh, 30 years in the area depending on degree day accumulation and rainfall and then overlaid under that in color is a digitized version based on uh, downscaled climate models of the region. So we can see that there's pretty good concordance with the old zonation and uh, s 
and the, the types of uh, production, uh, <coughs> the weather conditions that prevail that dictate uh, the production that occurs there. And if we go into 2050, um, based on climate projections for the region, the bright color is a new agricultural zone that hasn't existed before. It's new in that it has high, m more degree day accumulation and, and lower precip in the summer times and higher precip in the winter times. It's going to be challenging for the industry to adopt to it because it's, it's, it's to adapt to those conditions because of it's, it's unique. And some of the other parts of the landscape are not changing based on those projections. Um, and this is an A1B projection, but we can do all these different kinds of projections and there are ranges of change, but they're all pre uh, presenting a challenge that, uh, that stimulates our project. And we have four goals. One is adaptation to those changes. And uh, these are partly dictated by National Institute for Food and Ag. Um, we need to develop sustainable ag practices for cereal production systems as they exist now and into that projected future. Mitigation, as you know, agriculture is a source of greenhouse gases and nitrous oxide emissions and carbon emissions from this system is, uh, as is the case globally. Uh, but it's, there's potential to reduce those emissions uh, with improved efficiency of the use of inputs and uh, changing our tillage practices. Participation, this is a science-based agricultural approach that needs to be communicated and adopted by producers if they don't adopt some of the uh, recommendations or the findings, then we're not succeeding. So it's also education. So we have uh, a K through 20 dimension. So we, have, we are doing curricula for elementary, high school, undergraduate, undergraduate research and uh, graduate education. And I don't know, I thought I'd show an org chart because uh, I saw one on the wall out here. <laughs> and, uh, and, mm, that looks similar, but it, it is a, it's useful to point out that we have objective teams working on monitoring of atmospheric gases and emissions and cropping system design and modeling and a socioeconomic dimension um, that includes uh, rural sociology and economics. Uh, we have pest weeds and pathogens, and that's me in part as an entomologist. We have the education component, uh, and then we have an extension component. And all of this is, uh, the intention is to integrate across these platforms, and so we are working hard on integration. Some of these uh, approaches, um, the modeling, integrated modeling, with John Antle leading that one, agro, agroecological zonation and projections uh, with Dave Huggins, life cycle analysis, and uh, I put cyber infrastructure down here. We have a big investment in cyber infrastructure, um, in data management, uh, uh, data portal, data storage, data integration, uh, probably about, uh, oh, I'm a, not quite a tenth of our budget is devoted to that. And then, uh, we have a scientific advisory panel and a stakeholder advisory committee that has developed, helped us develop this project from the beginning, uh, even before, as we developed the proposal, in fact. So I don't know, but this is a little bit hard to see, but I wanted to show our conceptual framework. So because it, it illustrates the integration as we go across from our situation, which is uh, the current um, climatic zones to the projected ones, the current mm, um, production systems across the region and the future ones, whatever those look like with our inputs, and it incorporates all these elements that are inter intercommunicating and includes experiments and monitoring, uh, socioeconomic work, uh, the uh, cropping systems model, economic modeling, uh, representative agricultural pathway modeling, and downscaled climate data. So we have climatologists on the project too. 
we're also, as we go forward on this, this downward arrow is indicating that what it's a five-year project, and what we're envision ourselves doing is not only establishing and succeeding with the objectives of our project within five years, but establishing a baseline for a long-term multi-decadal regional project uh, which takes some of its lead from the long-term ecological research networks of NSF, but is agriculturally focused. Um, a network of such projects is needed nationally, and we would like to be one of those. Just some pictures of us in gatherings, students and uh, the project as a whole. So we've been trying to, among other things, achieving all those objectives and getting those objective teams uh, functioning, to do integration across the project. And we have uh, a couple of mechanisms that we're employing. One is uh, the cross-cutting project teams like the a modeling team in which we are uh, working to incorporate input from climate models, economic models, and cropping systems models into a single framework with the necessary input from those who are getting the parameters for those models. Uh, which So that cuts across the whole project. Um, we also have something uh, called Integration Fridays, which is uh, virtual. We, we depend a lot on virtual communication because we have a distributed network of scientists and students. But those are uh, opportunities where for members of the project to present ideas for cross-project integration or to report on cross-project integration efforts. And uh, we did those for an entire year. The the first, the basically the second. Uh, year of the project and we're continuing to do those although at a lower pace because we've developed a tremendous number of a backlog of integration ideas that we're now working on that came out of those integration Fridays. Our students um, are, are integrating. Uh, and we ask them to do projects together on platforms of their choice across disciplines in at least pairs up to as many as four. Usually those are education uh, integration efforts and uh, extension integrated efforts. We're also trying to promote a, kind of an atmosphere of collaboration, even though we are a distributed network of scientists. So, uh, we've set up what we call virtual water coolers, where the, uh, the system, and I see that you use these uh, this kind of stuff a lot in your own work here because you have to communicate people electronically. But we open this and hope that we can attract people from all across the project to just come in and have those conversations that do happen out here at your coffee island when you have people uh, on campus here in your center. But in, uh, we don't get together as a whole project more than twice a year. So to promote those kinds of interactions, we have been using this. Uh, approach and another one is toolbox box project workshops. So, um, and that is uh, the uh, segue into talking about the toolbox. And I'm going to talk more about that and that integration than the Reach project, which in itself takes <coughs> a long time to um, explain in detail. But at least you get the context. And uh, that project, the toolbox project. And to quite an extent, my engagement and our engagement in the REACH project was itself stimulated by uh, the UI IGERT projects. We had two IGERTs at the University of Idaho. In fact, the second one was a renewal of the first one, which we're quite, quite proud of. And I was a, am a PI on the current one and on the first one. And what we did there is, uh, again, we were the focus of this was uh, resilience to, to uh, drivers of change in fragmented landscapes in Idaho and Costa Rica. And the distinguishing feature of our IGER project is the, that we uh, asked our students to work in teams. They work in teams throughout their dissertation. They're recruited into teams that are interdisciplinary. Every team has a social scientist, an economist, or a sociologist, and bio 
perhaps a hydrologist or a biologist of uh, various kinds. Um, and so we definitely enforce that cross-disciplinary effort. And the, those teams um, are also connected to local communities and stakeholders. So they are asked to do that as they develop their projects. They um, publish papers together and they are required to co-author dissertation chapters that are interdisciplinary. So it's a pretty strongly, uh, it's, a, it's a strong, it's probably the most extremely integrated Iger project design that we're aware of. Uh, it is the most extremely integrated that we're aware of. And that's this little picture there. This is Nilsa Bosca Perez, who's our project director for the, that Iger project. But uh, one of the things we do is have uh, coursework, of course. It's required coursework and also different kinds of uh, ad hoc seminars uh, in the Iger project to address different issues. And uh, one of these, when it was my turn to uh, lead that one year in 2005, the students approached me. So a lot of the best ideas do come from the students and go up, I, I think is the case, and integrate. And, and so this toolbox project really had its genesis and students who said, we are working across these wide disciplinary divides, but we're encountering a lot of difficulties. And we think that they might be fairly fundamental difficulties, that is, uh, we're using different, not only we're we using different vernaculars, but we really have some different assumptions that we seem to be bringing to this way we do science. And uh, it's causing us to stumble in years two and three of our project. So uh, that was philosophical. And uh, I went up the hill to, uh, to meet with uh, Michael O'Rourke, who's uh, professor of philosophy at the University of Idaho and ask for some, some help and some thinking about this. So we, we organized a seminar. It was in 2005. So I think it was the only philosophy slash entomology offering uh, that I'm aware of at, on our campus. So we're proud of that. And we, and we invited people from all across the campus, the Iger Project and, and anyone else who's interested in thinking about the challenges of working in interdisciplinary divides that are rather wide, and what, what can we do to try to promote uh, and improve that type of collaboration. We discovered, examining the literature, that of course it's quite easy to find the recommendation that you have to improve your levels of communication across the, across the disciplines. That's a must. It's in the National Academies study on interdisciplinarity, but there's really, the next page doesn't have anything on it about how you do that. And in fact, the literature's really mm, pretty uh, uh, shallow. <laughs> uh, I was going to, somewhere between shallow and absent. Um, so it was easy to discover within a couple of weeks that there was this gap, and then the rest of the seminar was all about, so what do we do about that gap? And uh, we concluded, based on our reading of the literature about the failures of interdisciplinary collaboration, that many of the challenges do concern communication that are philosophical. We could be biased because we were in the seminar room in the Department of Philosophy but as we had this discussion. But I think it's legitimate that uh, different vernaculars, which themselves are uh, founded on concepts, uh, difference in scale and scope of inference, that the the sciences can make, difference in different methods of drawing inferences, different views of the role of stakeholders in driving our science, different approaches to incorporating the value of researchers into the work, and reductionist and holistic approaches are examples of those, and all of those are philosophical or they can be perceived as that. And our conclusion was if teams that are wanting to communicate better uh, were able to reveal the dimensions along which these divides occurred at this level, uh, they would have a better, more productive, successful project ultimately in, uh, in their integration. So we recommended, uh, and those of you who have seen the 2007 paper, it's just, it's basically outlines what I just said and then recommends that the way to do it is to have a structured dialogue with some prompts to make sure that the team really investigates broadly across the potential uh, 
philosophically based divides that may occur. And uh, that, pr that paper allowed us to, uh, to get funding from the National Science Foundation to keep going, to develop workshops based on that <coughs> recommend recommendation. <coughs> Uh, science and society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess so. I know first. <coughs> when, when? How new is it? Is it uh, I want to say it's the last five or six years. Yeah, so we must have been pretty early in. Since we were funded in 2008. So. This is a little uh, primer on it. Um, I think this stuff is already, I've already gone over it, so I'll keep going. We use dialogue methods based on that, uh, on a set of prompts. And we have <coughs> two things we're uh, doing. Uh, we have the <coughs> a table of prompts that is the basis of these workshops. <clears throat> and then the workshop itself is about a two to three hour session in which people are asked to think about all the prompts and, and discuss them with one another. I will. So uh, there's 34 in the current STEM instrument. We have a couple of different instruments now. One is called the STEM instrument. And uh, they, uh, we divide th this into modules, and each module has a core question that's philosophical, and then a set of prompts that attempts to pull out um, some details. And I, I should have made this bigger. I'm going to read some, though. So here's uh, an example of a module. It's called Motivation. Does the principal value of research stem from its applica applicability for solving problems, is the question. What's the value? Why do we do science? Um, and then we have we decided to different from what you might have read in the bioscience paper. Here we have uh, Likert scales, so that we ask people to read these statements that parse out this core question and le indicate their level of agreement. Principal value of research stems from the potential application of the knowledge gained. Disagree, agree, don't know give them an NA op option. And we did this because for one, re one reason was that we uh, started to, we ran a number of these toolbox sessions without the Likert scale and just asked people to kind of think about it. But this helped force people to at least put themselves on a continuum that they could imagine. And then we could ask them to, if things just get a little bit stalled uh, in the workshop, you can just ask people to reveal their numbers and then talk about why there might be discrepancies, which could be based on real differences in views or differences in interpretation of these prompts. Cross-disciplinary research is better suited to addressing applied questions than basic questions. That's a, another example of parsing this one out. Um, the importance of our project stem, stems from its application. Example prompts. Then another set here. Uh, do values negatively influence scientific research? Incorporating one's personal perspective in framing a research question is a never valid. Agree, disagree. We try to have those statements be fairly stark in there uh, so that in the framing, so people would be, in so, so we would get a diversity of liquor responses. So that's what it looks like. What we do with it is uh, allow a team, and the teams have ranged from four up to as many as 17 people, uh, to go through the entire toolbox that has all those modules, and then discuss at their own pace, not their own pace, I guess, because they have unlimited <laughs> time, but uh, following their own trajectory, going through the toolbox, the things that are most interesting from that for them. Uh, and uh, a facilitator is always present, and that facilitator, though, has a very minor role, tries to be, say that as little as possible, and let the discussion go. Maybe once in a while saying, okay, let's uh, see a link between what you're saying in this module and this other module. Are there any views in this other module? And then kind of step back. 
and hope that the team covers most of the modules during the session. And uh, then we record that session, we generate a transcript, we collect all the Likert scores from everybody in the workshop, then we also distribute the toolbox again at the end of the workshop and we ask them to do it again. So we get a pre and post evidence of any shifts in those Likert scale scores as a result. Uh, we make that into a graphic so that uh, we can visualize the team's distribution of scores on the different prompts and, uh, <clears throat> and also how those might have shifted. Uh, we provide a full transcript of the session um, and we provide a, a letter from the facilitator saying here's what we saw and then uh, that's how the application has uh, been, that's how it's, it's been applied so far that's how we've been doing it and uh, it seems to work in the sense that uh, surveys of workshop assess assessments of participants who we contacted and asked uh, to respond to some of these uh, uh, <coughs> questions about their participation. 84% say the workshop had a positive impact on awareness of the knowledge, opinions, or scientific approach of teammates. 82% had an overall positive impression of going through the workshop. Uh, statements about impact on professional development were generally positive, 77% of the uh, app respondents were, 70, were entirely positive about that, and so on. So there's generally a good response by users. They had a good experience with this. Evaluating it beyond that has been a challenge for us. Uh, we don't have control groups. We don't have measures of team output uh, beyond the toolbox. Uh, those are the kind of things that are probably indicated, but uh, we haven't uh, figured out how to do that yet. But one thing we have understood is that uh, the, the STEM toolbox may be um, uh, not the only one that could be useful. Uh, some of the modules, you can imagine modules that uh, focus on the issues that are particularly in important or troubling for different kinds of collaborations. So we've gone in two directions with this. One is a translational health science toolbox. It has, um, and we did that with the help of potential, like a focus group. Um, in this case, the translational health sciences unit at University of Washington. And also a translational climate science toolbox which is one that we're using in the REACH project because of our focus on climate science. And uh, we did that by getting the climate uh, group together to uh, discuss in general terms the kind of things that are challenging for them in their collaborations, uh, review the literature on translational climate science, and distribute some surveys to natural resource managers concerning their views on the challenge. Evaluate those results and then develop modules that are really fine-tuned for, for climate inter interactions. We pilot tested it at the Climate Science Boot Camp in 2011 uh, with graduate students from UI, Oregon State, and UW. And uh, we've also used it subsequently in the, in the REACH project. And uh, these also, this little experiment seemed to produce the kind of results we hope to get with the toolbox. The key discovery examples are, I was not aware of the intimate conflict resource managers had with scientists. The complexities within this cycle was a key discovery. The toolbox helped open up core values of both scientists and resource managers, allowing for realizations otherwise impossible. Would you use it again? Uh, positive statements um, about the utility of, of that. And uh, the Climate Science Toolbox has these modules. They're similar to the STEM motivation, but they're more particularized. Motivate scientists to 
uh, what primarily motivates scientists to conduct climate science research, what role should researchers play in solving real world, real world problems, that's sort of the uh, two ways to parse out the basic applied continuum, values management, what values matter most in natural resource decisions, value science, do values have a legitimate role in scientific research, trust, which is an issue with climate, applied climate science um, because of the complexity perhaps of the uh, inferences that are required and uh, the models that are required to understand it and apply it. Uncertainty again also is was an important theme that the climate scientists identified and how does it affect climate science research and its application and ways of knowing which is getting back to the epistemological theme that uh, occurs in the the STEM toolbox. So uh, I'll read some examples. Um, bridging science and policy should be the principal contribution of climate science research. Scientists and natural resource managers should be professionally rewarded for working well together. Knowledge generated by research is valuable even if it has no application. So you can hear that some of the themes are similar to what we found in what we use in the STEM. Uh, toolbox, but here they're just particularized or frame, framed a little bit differently for the climate toolbox. Managers should have greater respect for the constraints on publishable scientific research. So here you can hear a theme that seemed to come up in the team and in, in these uh, in the groups, the focus groups that helped develop this, of that differences in the in the uh, kind of incentives, the professional incentives for the managers and the researchers. So we're using that toolbox within the REACH project um, to improve the communication across the whole project, um, to s try to reflect the issues that are unique to REACH and to integrate into the life of the REACH project to maximize its impacts. So all we've done so far is employ the climate science toolbox. We conducted sessions with all of our PIs and with the, all the students and all the postdocs. So they've all been through the toolbox. Um, we're analyzing those results uh, because what we did was do the before, do the after, and then we've online sent the toolbox around to the entire project for another iteration six months later. And those will be, that's the grist for analysis to look at some of the patterns that we might see dip in <coughs> responses based on uh, location and career, uh, declared discipline, because every one of the participants provides a demographic profile along with their responses. Uh, degree of experience prior to joining our project in interdisciplinary collaborative work. And we've also conducted it with our uh, summer interns and our REU affiliates, so we do that every year and we've been doing that with our REU project that's associated with uh, this project. Uh, we're this summer doing follow-ups uh, with groupings that are based on uh, maybe collaborate, we're, we're not doing, we haven't done this yet, we're going to do this this, this summer. This summer, O'Rourke, who is uh, the key partner here, who's now at Michigan State University, and uh, two other toolbox personnel in the project are gonna be with us for a month on the Palouse, and uh, we're going to uh, do some additional toolbox work. We're going to um, complete that analysis and share it with the group. And we're also going to, uh, think about different ways that we might implement the toolbox in this uh, summer of 2013. <clears throat> One way is to uh, kind of empirically look at the collaborative groups that are occurring in the project and have those break out and work on them together. Uh, what we've done so far is kind of do the toolbox across the whole project and as you, un you can, you know it's a very big project. so. Everybody does it and we do breakout groups that are just kind of randomized to get these ideas out and into the dialogue uh, that pertains to the project. But we may need to do this with groupings that are based on interdisciplinary collaborations that are underway in the project. 
Another possibility is to use uh, groupings that are suggested by a social network analysis that we have done on the project. So everybody in the project has completed this survey, I think. Uh, if not, we need to send a couple more emails and remind people where every member of the project indicates their level of uh, inter interaction with and types of interactions they're having with everybody else in the project from shared thinking all the way down to I'm not sure who this person is, which does happen in a project of our size. And uh, that's going to produce some images of collaborative collaboration that's emerging. Does that collaboration look like our org chart, or does it look like something else? Either way, we can use that to uh, implement the toolbox around those groups that are, that are, uh, that are collaborating. We uh, could also uh, modify the climate science toolbox to add issues specific to reach, and I think we should do this. So as I mentioned in a previous slide, the climate science toolbox doesn't really address some of the issues around extension, around views of stakeholders, farmers, around agriculture in general, uh, our particular region. So uh, I think that if we worked on that, we would learn a lot as a project in generating that, and then we can poll ourselves or we can include that in our discussions. Um, we also need to think about, and this is something that the toolbox project as a whole is thinking about or struggling with, is it's a very nice intervention. We get plenty of feedback that it's a good experience by the users. As I mentioned, we don't have a mechanism yet to test whether having gone through it, a team is more productive than if they don't do it. Uh, but we also don't have mechanisms yet uh, for continuing, how do you take the insights that a team may uh, develop through doing the toolbox and ensure that that informs the activity of the project from then on? You could just do it and let it be but there may be some other things we should do. One of the things that happened in the, in the uh, IGER project that I think uh, is a good model for that is we had one of the teams approach me a year after they had done the toolbox and, uh, and say that they were having a problem, a specific problem about some issues that were uh, developing in their team, particularly around uh, integrating the economists into the team. And they, uh, so I suggested that they run in, well, they, they suggested we'd like to do the toolbox again. And I suggested, let's try designing one just for you and have everyone on the team be invited to submit prompts that they thought would be productive prompts for the team to discuss. And then put those in a pile and uh, group them and ambiguate them to the best of my ability so that people wouldn't say, oh, there's Lois asking that question again. And I know I'm going to react to that because I don't like the way Lois asks it or whatever it is. And, and just kind of get them more uh, generic. But uh, uh, they did that. Uh, the, we did the toolbox that way. The team zeroed in on those. I sprinkled them all through the toolbox, uh, these ambiguated ones, and they, they pretty much spent the whole time working on those. And it was faculty and students together. It was a very productive session. Uh, it didn't solve the problem because the, uh, it solved itself another way. Someone dropped out of the program. But, uh, but I, I thought it was going well. And I do think that it was uh, an indication that this especially if it's made uh, clear to the teams that when they do this toolbox, that this tool is available to you anytime and there are these different permutations. And a team could make up its own module for that matter or just make the toolbox for themselves or go through this opportunity to let me or one of us filter their concerns and create something that they could use to keep talking about issues that come up for the team. So some next steps, um, we're not the only $20 million climate and agriculture project in the USA, there are two others. And I work very closely with the leaders of those. We meet monthly 
uh, by video conference and we attend one another's annual meetings and we think about how we can learn from one another to run these projects. So it may be that the, I, that the toolbox will be applicable for those other climate caps. I'm very excited about uh, the opportunities that we have yet to exploit with uh, the data we have. I mentioned that we have transcripts and there has been a, just a very little work done with our transcripts in like taking in vivo for example and looking for types of discourse that occur around different kinds of prompts and who's speaking and what kind of speaking turn patterns there are all that all those data exist and we should be continuing to use them and we could still analyze the uh, transcripts that we have from our, uh, our REACH project toolboxes. And then I mentioned the social network analysis. I think there's a cool opportunity here where we will have the social network uh, data for our entire project and we, can, and we also have the toolbox data for the entire project. So every individual in the project, we know where they align themselves in the Likert scales on those 34 prompts and we know who they're communicating with, what kind of relationships, professional they, relationships they have with others in the project. So this, I think, presents a statistical opportunity to, to look for patterns. Do people with similar views collaborate? There's a, a simple hypothesis. Uh, more indicate uh, that they do more shared thinking. If somebody has a high index of shared thinking with someone else. Do they also have a high index of agreement on their toolbox prompt responses? Or is, that, is there no such pattern? And if there is such a pattern, that would be interesting. And if there wasn't, that would be interesting. So also use with stakeholder groups. Um, toolbox, I think, is still evolving. And uh, the climate science toolbox does work with managers um, and scientists. Know, natural resource managers and, and scientists, and that's what it's designed to do. But we haven't stepped out to think about our toolbox as something that we could sit down with our farmers and use. And what should those prompts look like? And uh, we know that there's some fairly strong differences of opinion about climate change and its uh, drivers but, uh, within our producer groups and also between our producer groups and the other participants in the project. And I think some form uh, of dialogue with this uh, that's based on the toolbox method for stakeholders would be suitable uh, to think about. We have just hired two weeks ago our extension person who's full-time funded by REACH and their job for the remainder of the project is to accelerate our uh, extending the work that we're doing in, in the project to our farmers and uh, that person may be uh, going I'm letting her you know, set her priorities but one possibility is to use uh, something like this to get a better understanding of the stakeholder views. Summarizing toolbox uh, we've done 98 of those workshops so far and only analyzed the transcripts for a few of them. Uh, we have four peer-reviewed publications and we have a conference volume. So we had a conference on in increasing collaboration, communication in collaborative science in 2010. And that has uh, resulted in 19 chapters. It's been published by SAGE. Uh, Michael is the lead uh, editor. Um, and it should be between covers in about a week or two. It's just about to come out. And it ranges from theoretical discussions of communication and collaboration all the way to how do you run your own toolbox if you want to. And it's a sort of pragmatic and theoretical and case studies about issues in which collaboration challenges were encountered and met in different projects. And the project also has a website. And uh, Michael is recruiting a postdoc to join him. Is the paper up on the website? On the website, all the papers are up there. Yeah. Yeah. And a few uh, slideshows and things. So it's, it's quite a bit of information up there. Um, so speaking to the choir uh, on the first point, we think the toolbox can 
promote communication as part of project inter integration. We have had some issues with eva evaluating that, but we have a strong feeling that it's working. Uh, and it works for researchers, it works for students at, at all levels. Even undergraduate students who may not be very sophisticated uh, in terms of the, their understanding of their own views about basic versus applied or reductionism versus holism, they get a lot out of it. So we, we haven't found, as we worried, it might be an impediment to their, their learning through, this, through the workshop. Um, and the frontiers, as I mentioned, is expanding its scope and integrating it into the life of projects and involving stakeholders. And uh, possible interfaces between the toolbox project and Succinct to think about. Um, some of your activities, all of your activities here as mentioned on your website would seem to be uh, potentially users of the toolbox depending on the groups and the challenges they're facing and their interest in this. Uh, individual fellows could participate in it the way we have with our students. We, we think that it's useful for a team to do it, but it's also useful for an individual to participate in it because we uh, have a good sense that this makes helps someone to become a more a better integrated scientist throughout their career, just having experienced it. Um, and uh, if there's interest, uh, Maybe some of those questions about evaluation of the toolbox as an element in promoting successful collaboration across disciplinary divides is something that Succinct would be interested in thinking about. And of course, that would be beneficial for the toolbox project, which is interested in knowing that. So back to that picture, and thanks a lot, and uh, ready for questions. Okay. Mm -hmm.